Hello and welcome to this live webinar on research in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Uh, my name is Dora Coates. Um, I'm a, an associate professor and a consultant rheumatologist at the University of Oxford. Um, and it's my pleasure to chair this session uh, and to lead us in the first talk today. Uh, and it's also my pleasure to be joined today by Alexa Sogdi, who is from uh, the University of Pennsylvania and is an associate professor uh, there in medicine and epidemiology. And I think it's fair to say that both of us have a strong interest in both of these topics. So we're going to uh, have a bit of discussion backwards and forwards. But obviously, all the way through, we're very happy for you to submit questions um, and we'll answer them as we go through. So attendees will be um, stuck on mute, I'm afraid, for the meeting. Um, but you can submit questions at any time through the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of the Zoom webinar. Um, and if you want to put them in as you're listening to the talk, um, we're happy to answer them at the end of each of the talks. Um, if you're struggling with any issues to do with the webinar and you need some help technically, uh, then if you use the chat box, then the amazing CSF team behind the scenes uh, will be able to help you with that. So uh, this is the plan for today. We're going to talk initially about the therapeutics and the research around predicting and preventing psoriatic arthritis. This is an expanding field, I think, in rheumatology at the moment. We're seeing a lot of interest and research in pre-disease, in pre-RA and uh, pre-connective tissue disease. Uh, and that's also very true in psoriatic arthritis, where obviously the majority of our patients have one condition before they develop the psoriatic arthritis. So it gives us a good target population. Uh, we're then going to talk about novel therapeutics for the treatment of psoriatic arthritis. So to give you a run through of the treatments that we have available uh, and those that are coming soon. Uh, and we'll discuss at the end of each of those topics uh, if you have any questions that you want to put through that Q&A box. So uh, I'm going to kick us off um, and think about uh, predicting and preventing psoriatic arthritis. So obviously we know that most people have psoriatic arthritis following a diagnosis of psoriasis. About 70 to 80 percent of people will have skin psoriasis first. So we have this very well-defined population who are at risk of getting psoriatic arthritis. It obviously won't pick up everybody. There are some who won't have skin psoriasis or who will develop that later. Um, but the vast majority have this pre-existing condition and it gives us a target population to think about screening. And we know that there's a big issue just in diagnosing psoriatic arthritis quickly. So not predicting it years ahead in the future, but just getting patients a diagnosis soon after they develop symptoms. And this is data um, from the uh, study in Dublin, but there are similar studies in other places um, confirming the same findings. If you have a delay in diagnosis, of over six months or 12 months, depending on the study, you have much poorer outcomes, even 10 years down the line. So even if we're treating people well in tertiary centres, if they've had a long delay before they get a diagnosis, that will cause a big issue many years down the line. And this is some data from the UK audit. So uh, for those of you who are not UK based, there is a national audit of all patients with inflammatory arthritis. So this is very good quality data that's collected across the country. Uh, and this is patients with psoriatic arthritis who were matched by age and sex to patients who presented with rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see that the time it takes for a patient to present to their GP, to their primary care physician, is much longer with psoriatic arthritis, maybe because um, they have more gradual onset of symptoms or milder disease to start with, or they blame an injury if it's a tendon problem, for example. And then it takes longer once they've got to a primary care physician to get a referral on to rheumatology. And that's probably things like uh, mixed pictures of disease where GPs are not sure. And obviously the fact that we don't have a great blood test for psoriatic arthritis. So GPs may be falsely reassured by a normal CRP and a negative rheumatoid factor. And we know that that even carries through to rheumatology as well. So there's still a delay once people get referred up to rheumatology um, and it takes longer for us to get to a diagnosis and to start treatment 
in patients with psoriatic arthritis compared to those with rheumatoid arthritis. So in total, and this is data from 2015, but we know in the most recent version has not changed a huge amount, um, that you can see here the delay is over six months. It's over 24 weeks um, for the patients with psoriatic arthritis. Uh, so we are seeing a significant delay in diagnosis and routine practice. So how do we screen and identify early psoriatic arthritis? So UK guidance says that we should be using screening tools and that these should be checked annually for any patients who have psoriasis and that you could use any of the validated screening questionnaires. Um, but uh, in the UK, they particularly pulled out PEST, um, probably because it's the shortest and the quickest to use. Uh, and generally speaking, they seem to perform quite similarly. Uh, and obviously the, obviously, the guidance for dermatologists is that if you suspect psoriatic arthritis, you should refer on to rheumatology. But it's difficult to target that screening. So this is data taken from a paper by William Tillett down in Bath. And you can see on the left, data from the CPRD cohort. This is a primary care data set in the UK. And on the right, the data from the Bath cohort of psoriatic arthritis patients. And you can see there's a little peak around zero where patients are getting diagnosed with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis together. But you can see there's a long stretched tail either side where patients have had psoriasis before their psoriatic arthritis by even 35 years. So it's not that there's a particular window where you will get psoriatic arthritis within two years or five years of your psoriasis. It can happen over quite a, a broad period of time. Um, and that's also backed up by this European study. This is a large study of, of thousands of patients across Europe. And again, you can see that cumulative percentage of people developing psoriatic arthritis is a very straight line. There's no big jump uh, around particular numbers of years where patients have had psoriasis. And again, you can see at the bottom, patients who've had psoriasis for only one year before they develop arthritis, some uh, 30 years or more. So it's potentially a lot of patients that we need to screen. And obviously, we are also interested in how that transition takes place. Um, so this is a diagram from Oliver Fitzgerald in Dublin. So we know that people have typically skin and nail psoriasis first. There may be some clinical and environmental risk factors like a family history, B27 and obesity. And then there may be this sort of preclinical activation of PSA where something's going on, going on immunologically. Um, that may be a sort of prodrome to the psoriatic arthritis. We've seen in a number of studies that we can get patients with psoriasis with asymptomatic inflammation on imaging. So patients who don't have symptoms, but do have inflammation on uh, ultrasound or on MRI. And conversely, we have patients with musculoskeletal symptoms, but no inflammation. And patients may well transition between all of these states over time. And then at some point, at least for some patients, that develops into a clinically evident psoriatic arthritis that would meet CASPAR criteria uh, and would start onto treatment. So who gets psoriatic arthritis? There are a number of studies that have looked at this and this was brought together in a really nice review by Alexis and other colleagues uh, in Nature Reviews Rheumatology a few years ago. Um, so in the red box, you can see things that seem to strongly increase your risk of psoriatic arthritis. So a family history, um, more severe psoriasis, psoriasis for longer. You've seen that cumulative increase in risk. So it, go, it goes up over time. Um, patients with symptoms, that, that kind of makes sense. Patients with arthralgia or stiffness, uh, patients who are overweight or have a history either of uveitis or thyroid disease. Um, there's um, a sort of lower level increase in risk and um, depending on the site of psoriasis, hyperlipidemia, depression and trauma. And you can see smoking appears in the orange increased risk box and the green decreased risk box because it depends on the study that you look at. So unfortunately, there's still a question over whether smoking increases your risk or not. And then although we have longer psoriasis duration increasing your risk, there's this sort of converse argument where patients who've had psoriasis for a very long time, but have survived without getting arthritis, 
may then be at lower risk. It's sort of a self-selected group. So there's been a ULAR task force that's recently published looking at this, looking at how we define pre-PSA, early PSA, um, and thinking about how we might address that with research. The overarching principles are shown here. I think they are broadly pretty obvious. Um, so we know it can happen at any time. We know we need to work together with dermatologists, that risk factors may be helpful in influencing therapy choices. So if you're choosing between a, a topical treatment and methotrexate, for example, or light therapy and methotrexate, then people being very high risk for arthritis may influence that choice. And that obviously rheumatologists have a key role um, in that um, decision. They've also developed points to consider for future research. Um, so patients with psoriasis and clinically evidenced synovitis should be considered to have PSA. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, that we should consider the risk of transition to PSA when we're choosing treatment for psoriasis. And that patients who have obesity, nail disease, or very extensive psoriasis should be considered at a higher risk. Patients should be informed about that risk. I think that's really important to educate the psoriasis patients so that they know to get help and know to raise problems with dermatologists or with primary care physicians. Um, they've also mentioned arthralgia as a risk factor, but obviously um, that can be tricky because an awful lot of psoriasis patients uh, that we see for review have osteoarthritis or fibromyalgia. But that ideally, we should be screening for these kind of symptoms with dermatologists. The imaging might be helpful to quantify your risk. Um, and that a combination of musculoskeletal symptoms and imaging abnormalities should be considered an entry criteria for clinical trials. I think that's probably the most tricky one. So in my clinic, in my early arthritis clinic, if you have musculoskeletal symptoms and imaging inflammation, particularly in a joint that's not easy to clinically assess, I would say you probably have psoriatic arthritis. It's just that I'm maybe not good enough to feel the swelling and that that was identified with a scan or is tendon inflammation, for example. So I think there's still a question about exactly who goes into those trials. And there's been some very nice terminology developed by consensus. So this was a project um, led by Lourdes Perez Chada in the US. Um, basically a Delphi exercise amongst experts to try and come up with agreed definitions that we could use. So individuals at increased risk, individuals with psoriasis and asymptomatic imaging abnormalities, individuals with musculoskeletal symptoms that aren't otherwise explained, so that's for your arthralgia patients, and then individuals with PSA. And I think that's really helpful moving forwards to try and use the same terminology in what's a very rapidly advancing field. So when you're going to talk about risk of psoriatic arthritis, the place you always look to uh, first is Toronto. Um, so there was a very good cohort of patients with psoriasis set up back in 2006 um, at, that specifically aimed to look at development of psoriatic arthritis. So they have over 600 patients who were seen initially when they came into the study and assessed for psoriatic arthritis and have then been followed with annual assessments to see who develops psoriatic arthritis. And these models have just recently been published. They were presented at ACR last year, but they are now available online. Um, and you can see here, they've developed two models, one for patients developing psoriatic arthritis within a year, so soon, uh, and one for patients developing PSA within five years, so over a longer time frame. Um, and you can see here things that came out on the previous slides. So pre presence of nail pitting, the presence of stiffness um, or joint pain, um, age, so over time, um, and then the use of biologics for psoriasis, which presumably here is acting as a, um, a marker of more severe psoriasis, and patient pain, which is obviously important. And you can see quite good area under the curves here, over 70% in terms of predicting the development of PSA. But as you can see, looking at the right hand side of these tables, this isn't yet a useful clinical tool. I don't think it's something that we can easily apply in our practice in terms of who should be screened in dermatology. 
And obviously the big question is, can we change this? So if you're going to do a screening study or an early um, intervention um, and identification of psoriatic arthritis, the big question patients are going to ask is, is it going to make a difference? So firstly, obviously it would hopefully reduce your um, risk of damage, joint damage and other adverse outcomes because you would be diagnosed very early, almost before you have it. Um, but there's also some interest in looking at whether treatments for psoriasis may influence your risk of psoriatic arthritis. And this is very tricky to look at in real world clinical practice. So there's a lot of bias in whether you receive a biologic treatment or a non-biologic treatment like light therapy or methotrexate for your psoriasis. The severity of your psoriasis is going to influence that potentially your socioeconomic status and your um, ability to pay for these medications, depending on your healthcare setting. So this is a study from South America that seemed to suggest with very small numbers um, that the patients on biological DMARDs were showing a lower uh, level of developing psoriatic arthritis over time compared to those who were receiving conventional DMARDs or, or topical treatment. And obviously that doesn't tell us that it would prevent you getting PSA. It potentially means that it's being treated and staying quiet uh, and not flaring up, but it may be able to influence on the risk of psoriatic arthritis. And then there's obviously a question about patient acceptability. So um, what risk of psoriatic arthritis means that patients would want to join a study about this? How bad does it have to be to make it worth taking treatment? Does that differ in different countries or cultures? And presumably, is that threshold different for different interventions? So if you were low risk, you might not want to take a drug treatment that had a lot of side effects, but you might be happy to have a lifestyle change, like doing some more exercise, which would be a lower risk intervention. And then as I've mentioned from the beginning, these patients have a disease already. They already have psoriasis. And a lot of the medications that are thinking about uh, studies around preventing PSA also treat your psoriasis. So if your drug is treating psoriasis and potentially preventing arthritis, then it's a bit of a win-win. But there's that balance with side effects and what is reasonable as a trade-off that we need to consider and that we need to get further information from patients. So at the moment, we're um, just working up to a dynamic choice experiment with a bunch of patients in Europe. Um, and so they are told you've recently developed pain in your joints. Tests show that your risk of developing arthritis is 50% in the next two years. And you have to choose a treatment to reduce that risk. So you can see here, you can choose drug A, which reduces your risk by a lot. But it's a weekly injection with more significant side effects or you can choose a tablet that reduces your risk a little bit, but is a bit safer in terms of the side effects. Or you can just say, actually, I wouldn't take either. I would stick with no drug and, and take my risk. So that study will help us to work out where the thresholds need to be for any interventional studies in the future to ensure that we can recruit. It's no good having a study uh, where patients uh, are not willing to go in. Um, and that's in collaboration with uh, a number of researchers working in the PREFER consortium, that's a European consortium, uh, looking at uh, patient preferences in rheumatology. Um, those same people have published quite a lot around patient preferences in pre-RA. So they have a lot of experience in that rheumatology space. And there's a lot of data available already for rheumatoid um, that we can uh, learn from. So there is a study currently ongoing um, run as part of the Hippocrates Consortium, um, which is led by Oliver Fitzgerald and Steve Pennington in Dublin. And this study is looking at whether we can identify those at risk and then potentially prevent psoriatic arthritis. It's a web-based study of 25,000 people with psoriasis across Europe. It's currently open and recruiting in two countries, uh, but we plan to have 12 countries online by the end of the year. And we're recruiting patients from dermatology offices, but also through patient support charities and media campaigns to get people interested in the study. And if we can get up to 25,000 people in that study, 
then we would expect around 675 of them per year to develop psoriatic arthritis. And we'll have that longitudinal data to look at their risk. Um, that study is collecting data every six months and is also collecting biological samples, as you can see in the pictures at the bottom, where patients can take blood themselves at home. So this is a bit like the COVID test that um, we used in research projects. And then alongside this, we're also hoping to link in with a, a US initiative, which Alexis is uh, heavily involved in, called SORCAST. Um, this is an app for patients that's been uh, developed in the US uh, that allows them to measure their psoriasis and track their symptoms over time, as well as medications and other useful things. But it also has specific tests for psoriatic arthritis. So there's a test where you use your hand to twist the phone and it can measure how much you can um, rotate at the wrist. Uh, you can see on the top right that patients with psoriatic arthritis have a much lower range of movement in the wrist uh, compared to controls or to patients with only psoriasis. It can look at your gait. You put your phone in the pocket uh, and then walk and it can measure gait as you're walking. And you can take a picture of your hand and of your fingers uh, and the system can compare one hand to the other and also compare the width of the finger to the width of the nail to work out if a digit has dactylitis. And again, you can see on the bottom right, uh, that higher uh, ratio uh, suggesting a swollen digit in dactylitis. And there's also another research project running in Europe called iProlepsis. This is using AI and uh, using passively collected data from apps and smartphones, uh, sorry, smart watches and other wearables to try and pick up a disease flare. Um, that also has an app basis to it. And the idea initially is that that's going to be developed in patients with psoriatic arthritis, aiming to pick up a flare of arthritis so that we can predict when somebody's about to develop a flare up. And then use those same approaches and that same uh, strategy in a group of psoriasis patients in the Hippocrates study um, to try and identify progression to PSA. So there's a number of quite new approaches and, and novel technological approaches to try and address research in this area. So I think the research and the progress around predicting and preventing psoriatic arthritis is very much a state of the art, but it has an awful lot of unmet needs still there. Um, we need to be able to reduce the delay in diagnosis for patients who already have psoriatic arthritis. And that's probably thinking around patient, GP and dermatology education and thinking about screening strategies, things like screening questionnaires, simple questions that people can use in clinic and combinations of these approaches. We really need to work on how we predict that PSA risk in different individuals so that we could potentially turn that into a risk calculator for somebody in the future, that a patient would be able to monitor their symptoms and estimate their risk based on their different risk factors. For the research, we need a patient perspective on what that risk needs to be and how acceptable uh, information and interventions are. Do they even want to know that they're going to get psoriatic arthritis or would they rather not know? And then obviously we need to think about what interventions do we try. It's very easy given that data from psoriasis to think about drugs that are already in the psoriasis space and that obviously has an advantage um, that patients can have a drug that will improve their psoriasis as well. Um, but there may be other interventions thinking about things earlier in that uh, immunological change uh, that may be beneficial as well. So I think we've got time for a bit of discussion around the um, psoriasis and um, predicting disease uh, space. Um, so, Alexis, I mentioned SORCAST, and I think you now have a trial recruiting in the US looking at potentially preventing PSA. Yeah, as I share, and Chris Richland are the PIs of that trial. It's called the PAMPA trial. So in that trial, there's a level of risk that is, we kind of created a risk score essentially to say, this is someone who's going to be higher risk. And one of the key pieces there is that they have some kind of ultrasound evidence of inflammation. And then those patients are enrolled in the study or a parallel observational arm 
And those in the trial portion are randomized to guselcomab versus uh, placebo for six months, then followed over two years. So it'll be interesting to see as people start to convert or, you know, what we can pick up in terms of differences there. And not that this will answer the whole question, but I think it's a first step and, um, you know, first way to get at this. So. And it'd be nice to have that period off drug afterwards to know whether you're just masking it for a little bit or whether you're potentially having a, a longer term impact on their risk. Exactly. So I think we'll need more long-term studies, you know, going forward. And I think one of the exciting things of even just like listening to you present all that is that look at how much work has been done in the last couple of years. And so yeah. while there's one first trial launched, I know that after that one, there's going to be a lot more to come. And we're going to have so many more cool tools, standardizing the terminology, thinking about which instruments to be using. I think all these things are so important. And the fact that very large communities of psoriasis and psoriatic disease, um, rheumatologists, dermatologists, clinical researchers are coming together to solve this big problem is really exciting. I think something that we have going for this community as opposed to some of the other communities that worked in a lot of isolated groups. So it's exciting. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think some of those digital approaches will help because you need big numbers. Um, so actually, if you can run remote studies, online studies, kind of minimize the burden on participants, particularly if they're going to be in a study for a long period, um, then that's really important in terms of acceptability for the study. And I think also engagement, you know, engaging the patient in that journey while there's some kind of um, Hawthorne effect, maybe, you know, you may transition more people because you're watching them and they're now knowing what you're watching, mm -hmm. but at the same time to keep them engaged and watching some of those things as well helps them be on your side as well, I think. So it's fun for like the Sorecast app, they can make movies of how things are changing over time and show their position. So I think weaving those pieces into these different studies is also really important. And so we've got a question uh, coming come in about axial involvement. So is this just another manifestation of PSA or is it associated with um, an accelerated development of disease or an even, even an increased burden of disease? Um, and I think axial PSA is probably the other big topic that's been really trendy in the last few years, isn't it? There's been so many studies and editorials beyond belief uh, about axial disease in PSA. I mean, I think clearly it is an extra burden in terms of from the patient perspective, but I don't think we understand a lot about how predicting PSA is in peripheral disease versus axial disease often these are just combined and we're not really thinking about them in phenotypes, are we? Yeah, and I like your point about the when the number of editorials exceeds the amount of data, then you know it's a really hot topic. And I think we just don't know enough. So, and back pain is so common that sorting that out in a questionnaire is just too hard and then imaging is too expensive. And sometimes the reliability of imaging is difficult. So we have a lot to figure out there. There's a whole working group on that. So um, I, I'm, I think the peripheral is kind of where we're spending a lot of our effort right now. And I suspect it may be a limitation of some of the peripheral arthritis studies that we, we know it, for example, in the web-based study of people have developed psoriatic arthritis because of a letter from their doctor. But if that's not clear about axial disease, we may not know exactly whether they have axial disease or not. They may not have been fully screened and imaged to look for axial disease. Um, and so it's quite hard to pick up there, I think. Exactly. Yeah, no, that, I think that's exactly right. That diagnosis is so difficult. And, you know, in reality, the majority of people that we're seeing in clinic who are developing new PSA have peripheral disease. So it's not that common. It's, it's about, about 4%. And one of Daphne's studies from um, that she presented at ULAR had axial disease only as their presenting symptom. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we can get 96% of people by just looking at peripheral, then we're doing a pretty good job to start. Yeah, no, that sounds good. And obviously there's a lot of work around better diagnosis of axial spar in general, which is bound to benefit those patients, isn't it? Thinking about, again, screening questionnaires for axial spar, B27, CRP, and kind of different screening strategies, a lot of which will probably pick up our axial PSA patients as well. Exactly. Lovely. So I'm going to hand over to you, Alexis, for the second half, and we're going to talk now about treatments for psoriatic arthritis. Sounds great. Um, and I thought there'd be more interaction. So please pull, put your questions in here because I can skip through things as we go. Um, so in terms of talking about novel therapeutics, there's so many therapeutics that I thought it was actually a good idea to just start with, you know, what, what are the different treatments? Um, I am talking about treatments. So these are my disclosures. 
Um, if you're outside of psoriatic disease and you don't go to grappa or, you know, study what's going on, um, this is what people see, which is lots of different words that go with different treatments. They, some of them don't make sense. There are a lot of new ones out there. And so um, this can be kind of a word soup kind of an adventure. So we're going to try to break it down a little bit different than that. Um, one way to look at this is look at how far we've come. So again, like Laura was just giving this talk on all the things that have been going on in terms of pre-PSA and understanding prediction of PSA and can we prevent PSA? Um, so that research has really come a long way. Similarly, treatments in psoriatic disease have come a really long way as well. So this is United States timeline, so FDA approvals. Um, we don't have the yet, bimikizumab yet, but um, EMA has already approved this for psoriatic arthritis in 2023. We're hoping for somewhere in the 2023-2024 timeline. Um, but lots of different therapies. If you go back to 2002 and 2000, through 2005, we really only had the three TNFs, added some more TNFs, and then some new MOAs, MOAs just in 2013 is when we started to have new MOAs. This is when the pathway really started to differentiate is when we had the um, uskinumab and secukinumab and apremolas. These are therapies that are not approved for rheumatoid arthritis. So this, this is about when we start to see the differentiation of treatment for psoriatic arthritis from treatment from rheumatoid arthritis. So this is now our PSA treatment landscape. There are a lot of different therapies available. Anything in italics is not yet approved. So the novel therapies are in uh, italics. Um, there's more that I haven't added to this as well. So let's start with oral small molecules. So with using ACR, American College of Rheumatology terminology, we switched the CSDMARD label to oral small molecule because of the fact that these therapies are um, don't have data to su support that they prevent joint damage from progressing. Um, now, since then, that's also true of other therapies in different boxes, but just to, to make note that while we use the term CSDMARD, most of these therapies don't have DMARD um, uh, data or data to support a DMARD. So beyond the oral small molecules where we have methotrexate, sulfasalazine, cyclosporine, luflonamide, and apremolast, we have the five TNF inhibitors we've mentioned, ustekinumab IL-1223 inhibitor, then IL-17 inhibitors, secukinumab and ixkizumab. In Europe, you now have bimikizumab. In the US, we have bradaliumab, but, but only for psoriasis. So this has been tested in uh, psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis found to be effective and very similar to secukinumab and ixikizumab, um, but never uh, sought approval for those indications. The approval is only for psoriasis. Um, I'll come back to this as we talk about IL-17 inhibitors. There are also two new IL-17 inhibitors. Actually, there's more than this. There's nantecumab as well, but there's sotolocumab and izacabep, um, which are small molecule IL-17 inhibitors. Um, and again, more to come there. Abitacet is CTLA-4 IG um, is approved for psoriatic arthritis, it really doesn't work for the psoriasis, and we don't really use it that often in psoriatic disease, so I won't spend too much time talking about that today. From the JAK inhibitor perspective, we have tofacitinib and upadacitinib. In some places in Europe and Japan, you have filgotinib. We don't have that in the United States, so that's why it's italicized. There are other JAK inhibitors that have been tested. There's also a TIC2 inhibitor, ducravacitinib, so this is available in the United States for psoriasis, but not yet for PSA. Um, only a phase two study in PSA has been published. Uh, so we're still waiting for phase three data for that. And finally, for interleukin-23 inhibitors, we have guselkimab and rizinkizumab. And then tildrakizumab is approved for psoriasis, but not for PSA yet. All right. So how do you use all those therapies? I'm not going to go through the GRAPA guidelines today, but this is one of our newest sets of guidelines. ULAR also just released new guidelines at the ACR, I'm sorry, at, at ULAR, um, and they look remarkably similar to this. So um, I like this image, and so you can kind of see the flow. Laura uh, is the first author on this paper in Nature Reviews Rheumatology. Somehow that got cut off there in 2022. So this is a nice paper that walks you through how we consider using them. And one of the ways in which we consider using the therapies is by breaking it down by which of the different features do you have active. Do you have peripheral arthritis, axial disease, emphasitis, dactylitis? Does the patient have some moderate to severe psoriasis? Do they have nail disease? And then do they have inflammatory bowel disease or uveitis, which may um, direct some of the different therapies you may use? And then that all goes through the lens of, does the patient have other comorbidities? And then finally, um, you know, after you've treated, you see how patients are doing, then you may go back to the algorithm again. Now in this algorithm, the key factor here is really the axial disease and the key factors and the psoriasis, how bad are those? Because those are gonna drive 
which of these therapies you use. And so when I said the axial disease, I put these little boxes here because really the only three sets of therapies or three classes that we use for axial disease are TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors, and JAK inhibitors. Sometimes I still see the occasional patient with axial disease being treated with sulfasalazine, not a treatment for axial disease in PSA or XPA. Um, TNF inhibitor, IL-17 inhibitor, or JAK inhibitor. Now, if the patient has peripheral PSA and more severe psoriasis, you may think about a therapy that's going to be targeting the psoriasis a little bit more effectively. We know now that the IL-17 inhibitors and IL-23 inhibitors are just much better with the skin than TNS. There's head-to-head -head trials in psoriasis to demonstrate that. So those are some of the considerations that come up as you're picking a therapy. All right, let's talk through some of the individual therapies. So TNF inhibitors, I'm pretty sure everybody on this call, if you're a rheumatologist and have been trained in rheumatology, you know these very well. There are five of them. What I think is different in SPA that people forget about, SPA or PSA, is that they actually have different indications and different dosing for some of those indications. So for example, if the patient has Crohn's disease, you may choose adalimumab, infliximab, or sertoluzumab. If the patient has ulcerative colitis, it might be adalimumab, golimumab, or infliximab. And if the patient has uveitis, follow the uh, treatments for Crohn's disease. So those treatments, those kind of go together, adalimumab, infliximab, sertoluzumab. And then if the patient has moderate to severe psoriasis, same ones, adalimumab, infliximab, or sertoluzumab. The dosing matters. So for sertoluzumab, the dosing for psoriasis is the higher dose. So it's 400 milligrams every two weeks. So that's the loading dose for the first three shots in psoriatic arthritis and ankles and spondylitis, but it's the continuous dose for psoriasis. And that matters. So we'll come to that when we talk about the IL-17 inhibitors too. If the patient has moderate to severe psoriasis, just go for that psoriasis dosing. Biosimilars are here in the U.S., so we finally just got these in July, so we even, don't even know, you know what's going to happen with some of our patients who are covered by insurance. So far, it really hasn't made much of an impact, um, and the pricing differences were not that significant. So uh, we will see how that impacts things in the United States here. You guys have had them for a long time, so nothing new for you guys. Among the IL-17 inhibitors, there's secukinumab and ixkizumab, which are essentially cousins. They're IL-17A inhibitors. Bimikizumab is the new kid on the block and is an IL-17A and F inhibitor. The thought was if you block both forms of IL-17 that you might get better efficacy, for example. Um, it turns out they're actually quite similar. Um, there may be some differences for psoriasis. We'll take a look at a trial in one minute. And then for bradalumab, again, I mentioned that this is available in the United States only for uh, the skin. Um, so it can only be prescribed by dermatologists. And this is a receptor blocker. So it's a slightly different mechanism than the IL-17A or IL-17AF inhibitors. Um, it probably does block F as well because that's a shared receptor on the A and F. But the interesting thing about this one is that it, in the trials of 4,000 patients with psoriasis, there were a few suicidal ideation and uh, suicide attempts. And so those uh, block this therapy from going forward in reality is probably something similar to what we see in clinical practice and really raises the profile of depression and anxiety in our patients. And then we should be asking everyone about them. You can imagine if you have a severe, if you have severe psoriasis, you get clear, there's some kind of activation energy there, almost like an antidepressant. So there can be some shifts there. So you, it's important to counsel those patients. Also as patients get clear and then they are com coming off of their therapy, they start to have a lot of anxiety and depression about the fact that the psoriasis may return. And similarly, when the psoriasis does return, now they've had this experience of being clear or almost clear, and it was a different set of conditions for them. And so that can be very depressing or anxiety provoking. So when I talk about this, I don't know that it's actually related to the drug. I'm not sure that I totally believe that, but I do think it's related to the disease for sure. And I think it's important to counsel about that every time. So IL-17 inhibitor or TNF inhibitor, are there any differences? So we know that the skin does better with IL-17 inhibitors, but what has been less clear is what, whether the joints do better um, with IL-17 inhibitors or TNF inhibitors until 2019 when the first head-to-head -head trial was published. And in the uh, trial for secukinumab versus adalimumab and then also ixkizumab versus adalimumab, both showed essentially the same results. They're equivalent for the joints. And actually, most recently in AXPA, in ankylosing spondylitis with disease damage, the SURPASS trial also found equivalence of the IL-17 inhibitors and the TNF inhibitors. So uh, I think this 
kind of leads to rest that one is better than the other in terms of joints. That may or may not be true after you fail the first TNF inhibitor. If you didn't do well the first time, then maybe you want to switch to a different mechanism like an IL-17 inhibitor. But aside from that, if it's a treatment-naive patient, they're actually equivalent. So if a patient has more significant psoriasis, you may choose an IL-17 inhibitor. So then I mentioned bimikizumab. They also um, had an adalimumab arm that was just a reference arm in one of the trials of DMARD naive PSA. And again, you see that the PASI score was better in patients who were initiated on bimikizumab compared to adalimumab, but actually MDA and ACR50 responses were quite similar. So again, probably looks very similar to ixkizumab or adalimumab in that case. Um, one of the interesting things is actually that the responses were similar in patients who were TNF-IR. That's unusual. Usually you see a reduced response in patients who are TNF-IR. We'll see once this gets to the real world if that actually makes a difference or not, but it suggested that these were working in, you know, really had a strong response in patients who had already failed the first TNF inhibitor. So when it gets to market um, in the U.S., the, uh, uh, one of the doses for psoriasis was 320 milligrams every four weeks. That's different than the dose that I just showed for inflammatory arthritis for AXPA and PSA, which was 160 milligrams every four weeks. So again, there's going to be a dosing difference once this is available. Um, when they used that 320 milligram dose, it was better um, than secutinumab uh, 300 milligrams in this particular trial. Um, I don't know that that's going to be the case when you look at the 160 milligram dose, though, uh, but there's not data to, to, to examine that. Um, what is interesting, though, is the difference in the adverse events. So when they used 360 milligrams, uh, the adverse events appeared to ha have more Canada infections, so that 320 milligrams more Canada infections than secukinumab, so around 21% compared to about 5%. So um, was that, that, that may be important to counsel patients about. It turns out at the 160 milligram dose, though, it looks very similar to secukinumab. So probably it's still in that, that um, IL-7, secukinumab, ixkizumab range. All right, moving on to IL-23 inhibitors and IL-1223 inhibitors. So ustekinumab is a P40 subunit inhibitor. Uh, the um, new therapies, the interleukin-23 inhibitors, guselkimab and rizinkizumab are P19 subunit inhibitors. So they more they only signal through interleukin-23 receptor as opposed to uh, ustekinumab which, and um, P40, which goes through IL-12 receptor and the 23 receptor, which is why it's called an IL-12-23 receptor. So ustekinumab has been around for a long time now. I think in general, we've always thought of it as slightly weaker than the TNF inhibitors. Um, but there was this interesting study published and presented over the last couple of years in which uh, there was an observational study where patients initiated in a TNF or initiated in an ustekinumab were followed over time. And at six months, actually, they're relatively similar. So first line ustekinumab and first line TNF inhibitor were very similar. Second line, vice versa, you know, similarly, um, uh, similar response rates, depending on, uh, regardless of which of the um, different outcomes you looked at. So it may call into question our idea that one is that one is definitely better than another. So uh, I throw that out there because it surprised me. So then we have the two um, uh, IL-23 inhibitors, guselkimab and um, also uh, rizinkizumab, very similar results in these trials. Um, again, these are doses that are generally used for psoriasis. So in for guselkimab, it's 100 milligrams every eight weeks. One interesting thing is that they tested 100 milligrams every four weeks in the DISCOVER-2 trial, and uh, it kind of laid over the top in general, although maybe a slightly better response, but there was radiographic inhibition for the every four weeks, but not um, different from placebo than the every eight weeks, and there was no difference in radiographic inhibition and rizinkizumab. This may be just that the patient populations have evolved so much that we're not seeing that. Uh, it's not clear, but in any case, I think th there is going to there's another trial ongoing right now, enrolling every four weeks versus every eight weeks in TNF IR patients. So we'll see if that higher dose or that more frequent dose makes a difference for those patients. All right, and then getting to combination therapy, I see there was a question in there about count combination therapy. But let's start with this combination um, in ulcerative colitis. So one of the things that we found is that many of these uh, these therapies have as monotherapies, not substantially reduce the disease burden on, of the overall population. So about 
30 to 40% of patients get to minimal disease activity. That leaves 60 to 70% of patients who are not in minimal disease activity on a monotherapy. So how do we get those patients to better disease activity? There may be many things, um, in, especially in the adjunct therapy and non-pharmacologic range and addressing comorbidities and so on. That's not the title of this talk today. We give, Laura and I both give a separate talk on that. So that's another whole topic altogether. But if we're just talking about therapies, one of the other things that has been considered is combination therapy. The nice thing about the interleukin-23 inhibitors is actually they're quite safe therapies. In both of these sets of trials, there are more adverse events in the placebo arm than in the treatment arm. So overall, very well-tolerated, safe therapies. So could you add them as combination therapies to a TNF inhibitor, for example? Um, this was tried in the VEGA trial in ulcerative colitis. This was a 12-week trial of induction therapy. So in, you know, in IBD, they do induction therapy and then they do maintenance therapy. So this is 12 weeks of induction. And what they found was that response to guselkumab was uh, verse and uh, golimumab was, was okay, but actually the combination of the two therapies was better for overall clinical response, getting the clinical remission and then endoscopic remission. You see even maybe bigger differences. And there were really not any differences in the adverse events among the three different groups. So that's also of um, importance here. So using the, that data from that trial, this was a slide we presented at ULAR after TREG that, uh, from a summarizing an abstract that was presented at ULAR. Um, I like this portion of the graph, which shows, let, let's just say you're taking a whole bunch of DNA and RNA and see what's upregulated, what's downregulated. This is the clinical researcher version of the basic translational scientist <laughs> description. But essentially, you have some genes that are upregulated in, uh, when ulcerative colitis is active and some that are downregulated when, when ulcerative colitis is active. Um, and so then you treat them with one disease. And what you would see is actually just a few things change here and there. But when you, when you treat them with combination therapy, there are big changes. And so um, I realized that some of the graphics dropped off when I converted to PDF. But what, what you just have to take my word for the fact that there was a lot more change across these different upregulated and downregulated proteins uh, that are, are genes that um, made that made us think that combination therapy may have better, more broad coverage of the inflammation. So there's a trial ongoing in PSA right now to address this. All right, last major class that I'll address today. Um, actually, the question that just came into the chat was about a premolast plus a TNF inhibitor. Um, so I didn't put a slide in here about that, but that is something that is commonly done in the United States. Uh, and it's hard because those, those therapies are both expensive therapies. But what happens is the dermatologist will prescribe one for the psoriasis, and then the rheumatologist prescribes one for the uh, inflammatory arthritis. And so you end up with the patient on combination therapy. In the Coravitas registry, about two and a half years ago or, or so, we looked at that, how many, how often were, were people doing this? And we found 90 patients with psoriatic arthritis on that combination. So a lot of people are doing this. Um, we don't have longitudinal follow-up data to look at adverse events or response to therapy, for example. And it's hard because people start them at different times, for example, and you add something because one's not working well. So, but what we do know is that it's tolerated and that people are using it. And sometimes I find that that can be beneficial for the patient who has pretty good joint control, but a little bit of psoriasis, for example. Um, I think, I, and I've combined Premalas with most of the therapies, not a JAK inhibitor, uh, but, but most of the biologic therapies at different times as well. Um, so it is something that you can consider just like you would combine methotrexate with those therapies as well. All right, final classes to discuss. So the JAK inhibitors and the TIC2 inhibitors, um, I'm gonna kind of skate through here. The, you know a lot about JAK inhibitors from rheumatoid arthritis. You know about the controversy about cardiovascular disease. Um, we already know that psoriatic arthritis patients have increased risk for cardiovascular disease. We may be able to extrapolate some of that data, but there's more data we really need. The harder part is extrapolating it to AXPA patients who tend to be younger and healthier. Um, Ducravacitinib is a TIC2 inhibitor. So TIC2 is one of the proteins in the JAK path, the JAKSAT pathway, um, but it's not necessarily, it doesn't, we don't really know how much overlap there is with JAK in terms of uh, you know, adverse events and so on, but from the trials of these TIC2 inhibitors, it looks like they are slightly different. So you don't see as much of the VTE, cardiovascular events, and so on. You see some different things too, like in some of the trials of psoriasis, you see some acne, for example. And that may just be because the dermatologists are picking that up and rheumatologists don't. But uh, those are some things that are different. 
Also, you don't see as much of the blood dis, you know, drops in hemoglobin, for example, as you see with some of the um, more JAK3 stuff. So this was a poetic uh, trial, and it tested apremilase versus dracravacitinib. Apremilase is in the black here, and dracravacitinib is in the gray. So you see it does have better activity than apremilase in uh, the skin, for the skin. This has not been done for the joints. Um, all right, so I'm going to skip that last slide so we can open for discussion since I am at my 20 minutes here of, and we'll kind of talk through some of these things. Um, so maybe Laura uh, can jump in here and give your perspective on uh, these different therapies that are available in the UK um, versus you know what's not available in the UK and uh, and Europe more broadly. Yeah, so I mean, we have most of these medications and we've just had an approval for bimikizumab. So we're a little bit further ahead in terms of bimikizumab. Um, we have uh, approvals for the JAK inhibitors as well and for Ducravacitinib, which has um, been through NICE for psoriasis already. Um, so I think we have access to all the drugs. I have limitations on how many I can use, um, but we can potentially choose a lot of these. And um, obviously, as you mentioned, we use biosimilars a lot. Um, so our, uh, particularly for a first line biologic, um, our standard really has to be a biosimilar TNF inhibitor because they are about 80% cheaper um, than most of the biologics. Jack inhibitors sometimes a little bit cheaper. And we obviously have some confidential discounts within the NHS that kind of affect pricing. Um, but there's very much a push for uh, biosimilar TNF as a first line. And it will be interesting to see if that comes your way. <laughs> Exactly. I know it will be interesting. So far we have, um, you know, it, it just hasn't come through yet. So we'll see. We have infliximab biosimilar that we've had for a long time. Yeah. And there it's kind of a mess for us because we'll prescribe infliximab. The patient will be sitting in the chair and then the, the nurses will call and say, oh, the insurance company actually wants you to prescribe Absola. And so then you have to put in Absola and then they, they call the next time and say, oh, the insurance company wants you to put in whatever other one. And so it gets complicated. And so we're just really hoping that doesn't happen with our um, Adalimumab, for example, because already in the US, we get lots of delays with the you know multi-part groups mm -hmm. dealing with biologics. So um, hoping it stays simple. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, I think with infliximab, we had a kind of slow influx of biosimilars and obviously smaller numbers of people on that. Etanacept, similarly, a, a lot got switched, but it was still a smaller number. And then the abnumab switch was huge. Um, but the NHS were quite organised with that and had a national um, system where each region had a chosen abnumab. So they didn't put the whole of the UK onto the same Adalimumab in case there was a, a supply problem. Um, but each region had their set drug and, and maybe a second option. Um, and so it was quite straightforward that everybody in this region switched to a particular type, um, yep. which did make it a lot easier. Um, and obviously you don't want to be changing every five seconds. It's sort of difficult how often you choose, you swap depending on those different um, costs. Um, yeah. Exactly. So you mentioned already, and there was a question about combination with anti-TNF and apremilast, that really you, and I know you use a lot more of this than we generally can get access to, um, but this is this is your safe methotrexate alternative. Yeah, exactly. And you know, in the United States, we have so many people who are overweight or obese, and then we get a lot of fatty liver disease. And so you use methotrexate for some period of time, and then you see the LFTs bump. And so it feels a little easier for us, you know, to use a primalas, for example, as opposed to methotrexate. I mean, aside from the side effects, you know, so then you get still about 20% of people coming in with adverse events, you know, significant diarrhea. So it doesn't fully stop the process or make it. All yeah. Better. Yeah. Can still be a bit of an issue. <laughs> um, so, I mean, yeah, that's something we have. I have very few people on a primalas. Because in the UK, it's the same access rules as a biologic would be. So you've been through two conventional DMARDs like methotrexate and leflunamide. You've got at least three tender and three swollen joints. And you can choose between a biologic and a premolast. Um, but you can't have both. And so generally, when I'm then at that point, I'm like, actually, I'd quite like a biologic um, to get just a, a kind of higher efficacy compared to the premolast. 
Exactly. Yep. I think it does. Um, I have seen benefits with that. And so, you know, and then when you don't, you just stop it. So. And do most of your patients tolerate that combination apart from a bit of diarrhea? Um, yeah, aside from the diarrhea, yes, actually. But then, you know, you kind of know with the diarrhea right away within the starter pack, you know if it's going to work or not, and then you don't continue. So in some ways, it's kind of the easy one because you, once you, you know right away and then you switch right away if it's not going to work. I see someone in the chat put that if a patient um, also has IBD, can you use a Premalast? I don't um, because of that. You know, like some of them are going to get diarrhea and then it just makes it confusing. I actually, I should take that back. I have one patient who is on it, um, but sometimes, you know, still gets confusing because you're like, well, is that just the Premalast okay. or is that IBD getting active again? So I don't tend to use that in IBD patients. That makes sense. And I think we do have increasing options for IBD, don't we? So you mentioned the Vega trial. There's a question about combining outcomes. That's something that, that as you say, is being studied. But I think historically we were put off by safety problems in rheumatoid. Um, and it's really only now that we're getting back to that idea of combination therapy. And it seems that an awful lot of it is with IL-23. Um, and maybe, again, because of that better safety profile, you sort of feel a bit more confident giving an IL-23 with another drug. Exactly. I think that, you know, um, again, I've only done it once and it's, uh, it's so expensive and so hard to get and write, you know, you have to write so many letters to get that in the United States. Um, <laughs> But it, and I've seen other people doing it when you have sample, when they have samples and stuff, but that's just hard to do. So especially for that patient who has more significant skin disease or the IBD patient, for example, that has axial disease and, but some, there's some balance there that could be obtained by getting um, the IL-23 on board. So I think there's lots of things to work out about when we would use that. And it, I, I hope that in the ongoing trial, we'll be able to see some markers of early, you know, can you make this a short-term thing and know who's going to mm -hmm. respond long-term and not, so you don't have to continue it for long periods of time. And I presume you maybe have someone on um, bedalizumab with a biologic as well. That's something we we yeah. see in terms of um, bedalizumab feeling safer because it's more gut specific. Exactly. Um, yeah, we do have that, plus TNF, for example. Yeah, that's yeah. Um, pretty, not, not that uncommon in our IBD patients. And I have pretty small numbers because it's expensive and the NHS would notice. Um, but where we do manage it, it's typically because they have two diagnoses. So they're on one drug for IBD and one drug for arthritis. And they are two separate problems um, so that we can get them the combination. Exactly. That makes sense. Lovely. OK, so we're just coming up to the hour. Um, so it's been awesome to chat about these uh, very hot topics and new therapies coming through um, and to hear perspectives and answer all of your questions. Um, thank you very much for attending and for joining us at the end of a busy and if you're in the UK, pretty hot day. Um, there will be a short evaluation form um, to collect your feedback if you can fill that in. Um, and we do definitely listen to that and change things to suit. Uh, and you will, will be able to look at this back uh, on the YouTube channel on CSF. Um, there is a future forum live um, looking at the future of JAK inhibitors and gastroenterology. That follows on quite nicely from our discussion with IBD. Um, so if you want to register for that in November, uh, then you can register at this link or on the CSF website. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Alexis, for joining me and for doing such a, a lovely presentation and run through all of those different drugs. Um, and we 